Uh, my name is Ara Tapuzian. I am the executive director for Michigan Venture Capital Association. And I'm going to let my, my co-moderator, this is new for us, we're, we're uh, doing this one for the first time, where we're uh, partnered on this webinar today for a great topic. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to my moderator to actually introduce herself, second moderator, we're co-moderators and really to talk a little bit about the sort of the genesis of this topic that we're going to talk talk about today. Sarah? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Sarah Kraft. I'm the Director of Venture for America here in Detroit. We're a national nonprofit that's focused on entrepreneurship and talent development in that space. And um, this topic actually came about when I was talking with Patty here, who will introduce herself, herself shortly if you don't already know her. Um, about you know how can we help companies connect to talent and think about what this looks like in the age of COVID and throughout the pandemic. Um, we know that things are gonna be really challenging and will continue to be challenging in our region for who knows how long, but we wanna make sure that um, people are aware of uh, how to get ready to bring new talent on, but also availability of talent, especially entry level from the Venture for America cohort. Um, for those who aren't familiar, it's a national fellowship program that brings in recent college graduates who are really, truly top notch. We select based on things like um, uh, problem solving, creativity, uh, self starterness. There's a really eager, active young people from across the country who want to make an impact in entrepreneurship and think that one day they want to be entrepreneurs. And so we wanted to connect some of these folks to all of you and some of the companies in our network. Um, and so when MBCA was already doing these really great webinars, we thought this was a natural partnership and audience to share. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and just briefly introduce the rest of the panelists and then we'll kind of get right into the conversation. Please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A function and we can make sure that we're um, answering questions throughout and then we'll also have some time at the end to answer any unanswered questions. Um, so Patty, why don't you just briefly introduce yourself then we'll go to Kendra and then Eddie. Sure. Hi, I'm Patty Glaza, and I'm the uh, I run Invest Detroit Ventures, which is a division of Invest Detroit. Um, this is not a cat that's on my shoulder. That's my dog Luna, so she might be jumping in and out during the <laughs> during the uh, Zoom call here. So, uh, Invest Detroit Ventures were the largest seed funder here in the state, uh, or at least one of the largest. So we've done about 135, uh, 140 investments over the past 10 years. Um, we're typically doing about 15 to 20 new companies a year, but we're really focused on filling in that early stage financing gap that companies have and getting that first capital raised. So we really are trying to help companies figure out the milestones that they need in order to get them on a full venture track. So we have a team of uh, five people that are really active um, all the way across from investments to portfolio management. Uh, we have about 80 companies active in our portfolio now, adding another 20 in the next couple weeks with our tech startup stabilization fund that we released uh, about a month ago. So again, very active players and really trying to help grow the startup ecosystem here in the state. My name is Kendra Mitchell. I'm Chief of Staff at Duo Security, which is a cybersecurity company headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with offices in Detroit, Austin, um, San Francisco, and London. I have been Chief of Staff for a little over a year and a half, but I've been with Duo since 2016. I came in as one of the leads on our legal team. And following our acquisition by Cisco in 2018, I switched to being chief of staff. Um, I am originally from Michigan, but left to go to college and didn't come back for well over a decade. And it was really um, the startup community here that brought me back and in particular duo. Well. Um, Eddie Damai, um, I am one of the uh, co-founders of Rocket Fiber as well as Code Labs. Um, Rocket Fiber, uh, we just exited with, so won't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, but it's an internet service provider. With Code Labs, we're in the smart building space, uh, particularly the IoT space. Um, and then, you know, outside of that, also uh, do some investing in uh, startups and real estate. 
Great, thank you. So we're breaking up this conversation into a couple of different topics. And the first one I wanna start with is actually just around the pandemic itself. So obviously it goes without saying that our businesses and startups, no matter you know size, scale or scope, um, have been impacted one way or another by the pandemic. And so uh, Patty, I want you to maybe start here. So as someone who works with a lot of companies in the region, can you talk about what's happening in like with some of the companies in your portfolio and how they might be iterating because of the pandemic? Sure, so we're seeing just a really broad, since we have such a broad range of companies in our portfolio, we're obviously seeing a, a really diverse range of, of um, reactions or implications to the companies. But I, I do want to give a shout out to um, not just the companies in our portfolio, but all the companies we've been working with in, in the state. It's been so impressive to see how, you know, it was really scary at the end of March, beginning of April, in terms of what does this mean? We got to transition our workers to work at home. How do we do our business? Can we do sales? And just that initial fear and how that's transitioned over the past really last six weeks to, okay, this is what our day, day job is. This is how we get it done. This is how we work together. And I would just been so impressed with the ability of um, really all the companies in our portfolio and, and across the state and their ability to make those adjustments on the fly, work together, talk through best practices, what does it mean to have workers at home? Can you still make sales? What does that look like? Applying for the big um, PPP program was uh, big for a lot of our companies and they shared a lot of resources with each other around what, you know, what does this mean? How do we do it? And we're still, you know, with that program trying to figure out forgiveness and what does this mean going forward, but just the ability to work together and, and, and try to sort, sort through that. So, you know, on a case by case basis, we've seen everything from super creative ways uh, to manage through. So, to Dooley, which does uh, manages or matches college students with homeowners to do small projects around the home, obviously, really impacted by uh, the crisis, but they pivoted for a short time to selling bread. So, they've been <laughs> selling uh, bread to uh, to local folks as they're planning um, on getting ready for the, the reopening. So that's and probably the most creative. Delicious. I will just say I ordered for <laughs> myself and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to try that one. Um, it does yeah. sound good. And then we have companies like Ripple Science, which is doing patient management for, uh, for clinical trials. And so they released a product, a uh, free, kind of trial product for teams that were uh, spinning up to address COVID clinical trials um, relate, related around that. And so really trying to provide extra, extra services to teams in need to help transition um, from trials that were done in clinical settings to where they're um, either in hospitals or be doing analytics from home. So just that broad range, right, from either kind of pivoting their product to, hey, can I use my product to help others right now in this time of need? And then just pushing forward, right, in terms of how best do we manage um, when people are home and we're trying to find people to talk to and sales. Um, but again, overall, I've just, it's really been amazing to see how technology has assisted, but how people have assisted each other and in, in helping make the transition. Thanks, Eddie. And Eddie, you're involved in a couple of different companies, and I'm wondering if you could just share how those different companies have been impacted and what your role has been as one of the leaders to help make that happen. Yeah, so, um, you know, on the, 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 the COVID-19 hit exactly as we were finishing the sale of rocket fiber we you know, we had signed on we hadn't closed yet and then had to do the closing actually in the middle of the pandemic which was interesting when you think of you know buying such a large asset uh with you know 80 people and having to do the closing and then transition during the pandemic which which we're still going through um so on you know on that end uh, being a, an, an internet service provider um, you know, internet is needed more than ever now right um so you know, residentially, um, no, no major issues there. On a commercial side, you know, the retail businesses are obviously struggling. So you know, we had to put certain programs in place to try and 
you know, help out during this time because you can't, there, when there's no business, there's no business. There's not a whole lot they can do. Um, so we're trying to get creative in how we can help uh, businesses during that time uh, or during this time. Um, and then from a team perspective, just having to work from home. I mean, the larger the team, um, the, the, you know, the harder it gets in some, in some ways. Now, again, thankfully, uh, with the help of the various different you know, software tools, it's, um, and there's, you know, two different perspectives. I have, you know, the rocket fiber side, which we come, like we, we did have some work from home um, capabilities during, you know, regular business and people did that every so often, but then to go to, you know, work from home full time when you have, you know, people that, you know, work in the field sometimes in construction, now you can't utilize those people. So the good thing is we didn't have to lay anybody off. The bad thing is you had people that wanted to work, but actually weren't able to work by nature of their jobs. On the code lab side, it's, <clears throat> we have an office here in Detroit and we have an office in, in Eastern Europe in Kosovo. Um, so, you know, everybody's been able to work um, really pretty normally. Um, now granted, again, we're not going to the office, but they're still able to finish the things we wanted to finish. But from a, you know, sales and biz dev perspective, um, everybody is um, kind of on hold you know, unless, and not wanting to make a decision unless they absolutely have to. So it's, hey, I'm still interested. I still want to pursue this. I'll still do all the due diligence. But when it comes to actually signing, you know, on the dotted line, it's, I want, I want to hold off just to see what's going on with the, you know, numbers and everything else that's happening. So it's just two different perspectives there. And then, you know, last but not least, you know, some of the other things we're invested in, um, from a real estate perspective, I don't think we've seen a huge um, impact just yet. Um, real estate prices are you know, kind of remained the same. Obviously, if, you know, on the rental side, that's that's a different story, uh, depending on the type of tenants you have. Um, and hospitality is just that's been the area where you know it, that's taken the largest hit. And I'm not sure the programs that were put in place, like PPP and all these programs, while extremely helpful in some way, I think the way they're structured make it almost impossible for businesses to take full advantage um, of the programs in the way that um, I think they were intended to be put in place. So. Thanks, Eddie. Um, Kendra, let's jump to you for just a moment. I mean, so Duo, I mean, because of so many people working remotely, uh, cybersecurity has actually been maybe even more front and center than in the past. So you guys have to operate like business as usual, but you're, the people who make up the organization are being impacted personally by the pandemic one way or another. And so can you kind of talk about that balance of how you as a leader in the organization help support the operation side, but most importantly, the people side of getting through all this. Sure, so you're right. Cybersecurity is on the top of everybody's mind. And so Cisco's CEO in our Q3 earnings call, I believe like last week or so, um, noted that security was one of like the best performing businesses. And so we actually make security products that sort of imagine a perimeterless world, right? So we sort of imagine a work from home or work from anywhere world. And so as businesses across the globe, we're trying to figure out how to enable their employees to work remotely securely. It actually meant a spike in our business. So not just new customers, but in authentications and support. And so it was particularly taxing for our employees as they themselves were trying to figure out how to shelter in place, either alone or with little children running around or with pets in the case of Patty. So it was a whole new world for all of us. So very quickly as a leadership team, we decided that it was just not gonna be business as usual, right? It, and you're working in a pandemic, it's not business as usual and that wouldn't be fair for our employees. So what we have encouraged our employees to do is first of all, take care of themselves and their families. And then on the work front, we will work to take care of ourselves. Um, and each other. And so work will work itself out. And so if that means people need to work um, reduced hours, we've just encouraged people to do what they need to do to get through. Um, and I think we managed through successfully, but more than anything, we've tried to just focus on what people need. That's great, thank you. And as the stay-at-home orders start to loosen, I'm wondering if you three could share your offices back to the office strategy, if you have one yet. Um, Eddie, why don't you start? Yeah, the, the going back to work thing, that's, that's a hard one. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is, you know, having, as, as a leadership team, continue to have one-on-ones with everybody on the team 
uh, almost on a weekly basis to just try and understand how the team is feeling. Then we do these you know, all team meetings every week to just understand how, you know, one, how they're feeling and kind of open the floor to everybody for, you know, ideas, thoughts. Um, and I can tell you that you know, some people are, are not comfortable coming back to work just yet. And the reason why um, is, you know, they either have kids or they have, you know, they need to see their parents or grandparents uh, to help support them in some way, shape or form. And we're saying, hey, look, if, if you're not comfortable, you're not comfortable. And you know, back to Kendra's point, as long as you're able to execute, um, you know, within that 80, 90 percent, even if, if we have to tweak some times and so on, then that's OK. Now, um, with regard to coming back to the office, obviously, you know, all the precautions that you know, are being as like we had to, you know, redo our seating, for example, just you know, basic operational things that you have to do. Uh, you know, make sure everybody has masks, make sure we have masks to provide to everybody in the event they don't have them or can't get access to them. Um, now, obviously, all the hand sanitizers and so on, but, um, you know, again, we, we also have to face clients. Um, that's just by nature of, of our job, again, as I'm in this transition period here on the, you know, on the rocket side still. So that makes it, you know, like we have to go kind of a step further where we're sending questions to clients with regard to, you know, um, have you traveled and, you know, are you comfortable with somebody coming in and, if, and trying to coordinate, like, hey, if we're going in and do an install, you know, maybe them staying in another room or another area of the office. And um, so it's just, it's a constant, I feel like it's an evolving um, procedural change that um, we're reviewing and looking at every single week. But um, I think the, the, for me, the most important piece has been the fact that, you know, while there's a whole lot of talk on the news about, you know, numbers going up, numbers going down, I think people understand that, you know, at some point you have to get back to work because we just, we have, we have to continue business. Um, but then there are you know, some people that understand that, but are just not comfortable doing it, even if it means that they, they can't work at all. Uh, Patty also has another small, as a smaller office, what are you guys planning on? Yeah, so I think we've got a couple, you know, so in addition to folks feeling comfortable or not, you have folks with children or uh, caretakers who cannot um, find others to fill in that gap right now. So they need to be home right now. And then you have folks who might have health reasons that you really don't want to expose them to an office environment. Um, and, but I think we also need to be mindful of the, the group of people who need to get back to the office from a mental health perspective, from a socialization, from a ability to work with people again, really need that environment. So we're looking at a slow reopening over the course of the summer um, in terms of no pressure for people to come back, but being able to start to roll out the things, you know, limit the number of people in the office, the protective um, gear, absolutely being thoughtful about that, protocols around keeping the office wiped down, and, and, but we're, we're working through that. We, we're not in a rush to get people back. Our, likely, we will not do in-person meetings, um, maybe not even until with, with outside folks, likely until after Labor Day. So we're going to keep it to the internal team. If things open up faster, great, we'll look re reevaluate. But we're, we're putting in an approach that we think will keep our team safe, and, but allow for people to start working together again slowly in a controlled way. And Kendra, you've got many, many, many employees with you. <laughs> How, what are you guys thinking here? So Duo has about 800 employees throughout the offices I mentioned and working remotely. But since we got acquired, we're part of this like 70,000 person like behemoth of a company called Cisco with offices around the world. And so Cisco has to take a global approach to this. And so what they're using is a phased approach um, throughout the world. But here in the U.S., it means that in this first phase, beginning at the end of June, um, essential workers will be invited back to the office. But because we're a cloud company, we can do our work anywhere. And so we don't have um, any employees that need to be in the office. That being said, as a leadership team duo, we're talking about this at least once a week, if not multiple times a week. Just this morning, I was talking with Doug Song, 
um, duo CEO and a member of the Detroit um, board for VFA. And he was noting his concern, both as Patty mentioned, for the people who just want to get back to work, either because they like it or because they're uh, having difficulties concentrating at home, either by themselves or with children. Um, and then we will have the folks like um, Eddie mentioned who just may not be comfortable ever. And so I think the conversation will continue to evolve for us. But what I think I, I see us trending towards um, is a decision to defer to people's comfort level uh, once we get back to sort of thinking about having more people besides just the essential workers in the office. Thanks so much, Kendra. Ara, I'll pass it to you to kind of cover our next session on strategy. Yeah, thank you. So as as this is a whole new world for a lot of us, we have to think, and I think the startups and the founder community has to think about um, how they're pivoting their strategies uh, around generating revenue. Um, Eddie, let's start with you. You know, maybe what talk about what you see businesses, what are they doing? But but are there are there some minor changes uh, that businesses can can take in order to generate revenue during this time? Yeah, I mean, to sit here and say that, you know, all businesses can do any one thing, I think is hard. So you know, looking at the industry you're in and then kind of looking, it's almost like at least what we've been doing, you know, with Code Labs is when we sit back and reflect, what, what do we offer? And how does that, uh, or is there any tweak we can make uh, what we offer to actually make this whole, um, um, you know, COVID-19 period easier for clients when we talk to them. I think the approach needs to change no matter what business you're in. Um, where, whereas, you know, the way we used to sell and or market our products pre-COVID-19 to now in the middle of it and post, I think, I think changes. So I think as, as a business, regardless of what industry you're in, um, and again, I've, I've, I'm around quite a bit of different businesses and and every one of them is changing the approach. Now, you know, whether you're in technology and talking about the fact that the products you offer can be deployed, you know, remotely, or, you know, uh, in our case in Code Labs, we offer a product that can manage buildings remotely from anywhere, which is a big deal. Our real estate industry is, um, you know, archaic for the most part still, and to have a product that could be deployed in your building to then allow you to, again, you know, have visibility into your building or portfolio remotely is a big deal now. So you don't have to send people into, um, 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 you know, into various, various areas within these buildings. Um, and then, you know, if you're in, in theater hospitality, again, the approach changes. You're no longer talking about your menu the whole time. Now you're talking about the fact that if you come to a restaurant, you know, it's a safe environment to be in. You know, we, we have taken all the precautions that we're supposed to take uh, to make sure that people are, are comfortable. So, um, you know, I think, you know, to sum it up, I think the approach and, and the way that we did things pre COVID-19 needs to change regardless of industry. And then just being able to sit back, I mean, the guy knows we, we put a bit of time to sit back and reflect and, you know, think through the lens of, you know, I sold this way or I offered these products. What can I do now to make it easier for both my current clients um, and then my potential clients? And last but not least, Especially in space, can you build, um, you know, can you build um, products on the fly that could help, um, again, your current client base and potentially help open doors with um, a new client base that then you can upsell, hopefully, when things normalize with your core product. So these are the, the approaches and things we've been, you know, taking and thinking about. And to talk about what Duo is doing, I mean, what type of strategic uh, directions have you folks been taking right now to sort of get ahead? Sure, so we've been thinking a lot about where the world is going and the fact that we may not return to normal and both like what that means for our businesses as well as like our clients' businesses. So say for example, a thing that we were just talking about last week is like, what does this mean for universities? And maybe that many of them um, are so financially impacted that it, it may sort of affect their ultimate success or it may affect their service delivery model to um, students. And so just having those sort of conversations and then going back to this notion of like, 
it may not go back to normal. So how can we meet customers sort of where they are in like an act of service as opposed to like maybe just thinking about how to exploit the situation. So really sort of being empathetic as we think through what our customers are facing. Um, and so for us, that means that we're considering how the way we work may have changed indefinitely. And so we're thinking about how we empower our customers in supporting their employees and, and working remotely, particularly in industries where they might have been slow to accept this, right? So say banking or enterprise customers, or and we actually serve customers like across the spectrum. So we also think about for those small and mid-sized businesses, how might we help them and how might sort of enabling their employees to work remotely securely actually help them get back to business. Um, so that's really sort of what we're doing. Andy, the, the one word fundraising, uh, it's certainly the, probably the most important word for uh, both the investors, but also the entrepreneurs. I mean, how should companies be handling their fundraising? I mean, some may have been in the middle of it or at the beginning of it, but what, what kind of advice do you have um, for companies that are in the midst of, of fundraising or thinking about starting fundraising? Yeah, so I think the rule of thumb for any founder entrepreneur is you are always fundraising and regardless of what stage you're at. So don't forget that. Even if you're not in immediate need of fundraising, don't forget you're always trying to build that next level of relationships. You're thinking about the investor updates you're sending. You're still scheduling kind of update, you know, Zoom coffee meetings. Right, so don't forget, be very intentional. I think it's easy to let that piece fall off the kind of the docket of priorities, especially with so much going on, but that really can't. You have to stay intentional about building those relationships um, and making sure that you're um, demonstrating that, that track record of execution. For our companies that were in the throes of fundraising, what we saw is, is a couple things. Those were, who were advanced still were able to close, um, but most are doing active bridge rounds with existing investors. And so being really cognizant of, you know, you're asking your current investors to step up the plate, give you a few more months of runway or a year of runway. And so helping facilitate you know, a deal that's reasonable for the company, reasonable for the investors in terms of risk taking, um, but get, if possible, close these interim bridge rounds that extend the runway long enough for not just for things, for business to um, start to ramp up again, because I think the constant theme here is we don't know what the new normal looks like, but we will get back to a growth period. So how long do you think that is for your company? being able to show a couple months of good solid growth in which new investors will, will want to participate. And that, that's the execution timeline. And every company in our portfolio is a little different here because they've been impacted a little differently based on the crisis. But understanding your own timeline, when, you know, how much money do you need? When do you think you'll really be able to start to grow again and giving yourself enough margin of time to actually do the fundraising? So. I would say keep it going, keep active um, intros, use your networks to warm intros go a long, long way right now because we're all so swamped. But if it's coming from a service provider or fellow colleague VC or someone in the, you know, active and accelerator in the community, we're much more likely to take those, those calls um, early. So just keep at it. Um, we, the investments are still happening, um, but just, uh, you know, and things I do believe will get back to a, a more steady pace in, in the next few months. Super solid advice. I mean, really, I think the, the, the game is still work offensively. Um, I think we're, we're beyond the, um, the shock value of what's, what's happened and, and business has got to happen, albeit different pace uh, and to operate differently. But I think you got to still keep your, eye on the prize, so to speak. So that's great advice, Patty. Thanks. Sarah, I'm going to hand it back to you. We're going to delve into the topics of talent. Hey, thanks. Um, 
So just to give a little bit more background on Venture for America, hopefully this answers your question a bit, Jeffrey. Um, this year we got more than 3,000 applications from across the country of recent college graduates to enter our two-year fellowship. This is by far our most diverse and most selective group cohort to date. We'll accept about 200, um, or there'll be about 200 fellows at the end of this process and they'll start work um, in August or September or later. We are expecting a much longer onboarding process than typical because so many companies are on hiring freezes or they're just insecure about what's happening with the world as we all are. Um, but typically they start work in August or September. We have a back uh, a closed back-end jobs board that's just open to VFA candidates to the actual fellows who are in our 2020 cohort. And then myself with my colleagues across the country who operate the 14 other cities that we work in, um, we find great companies and great places for them to go work. And so these are startups, these are high growth companies, these are VCs, um, any sort of, it can even be a smaller business if um, there is some sort of like growth perspective or interesting role for the fellow to learn and operate in the startup space or in, as an entrepreneur. Basically what they're looking for is a great leader, a great organization where they can learn the ins and outs of how to run and grow a business. That's what our candidates are looking for and that's what they're really good at. They're selected based on things like um, creativity, problem solving, um, all these sorts of like really uh, high qualitative qualities that are a little hard to select for, but we've got a really great track record of bringing over a thousand fellows through the fellowship now since we were founded in 2012. Um, so I, if you're interested in learning more, please contact me directly. There's a ton of information online at VentureForAmerica.org, but I'm also really easy to get a hold of. A, a hold of. It's sarah.craft at VentureForAmerica.org. Um, and I want to pass this over to Patty first. Uh, can you talk about, you've worked with several fellows, but also just young talent in general at ID Ventures. Can you talk about your experience bringing on fellows and other talent to help the organization move forward? Sure. And so I am going to give a super plug to the VFA program um, just because of the quality of individuals that we've had in our organization, I believe going back into 2013. So we really benefited from the having being able to start individuals on our team who we know are you know extremely vetted so they go through an extreme amount of interviews that are really grueling and hard <laughs> and and then they go through interviews and matches with the the companies themselves so uh, even with everything going on we're interviewing a couple of fellows right now and plan to bring uh, one on for uh, our next sort of period in time just because the quality of these individuals just really um, far exceeds I think what most organizations can do individually in getting that that large pool together so for us talent is essential to our business because what we're trying to do is build community relationships so we need people who are good solid communicators that can really handle um, kind of being out in front of the, um, you know, our community partners and, and holding their own. Oops, you went on mute, Patty. There we go. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, where'd you lose me? <laughs> uh, uh, just for a second, just restart the sentence. Okay, all right, sure. Um, so being able to evaluate new investments, being able to help support our existing portfolio, but we we need talent to continue to grow our portfolio and to continue to support our portfolio. So from our perspective, it's worth the investment of time and energy and it will be harder doing it remote, no question. Um, but at the same time, our team has found a really effective cadence to working together um, offline or I guess we're always online now, <laughs> but out of the office. And so for us, the benefit of bringing on additional talent right now really outweighs the, the additional kind of hurdles that it takes to, to onboard folks in a remote environment. Thanks, Patty. And Eddie, you've also brought on several fellows, but also several young people across Rocket Fiber and Code Labs to do really big jobs for those companies. Can you talk about how you've found that talent, but also, you know, 
ensuring they're making a really big impact on your, on your organizations. I mean, for me, if, if I was starting a business from scratch, or I guess the biggest advice I'd give founders starting companies would be to, you know, not always think about these like, you know, industry experts. I feel like you need a balance. My experience with both VFA fellows as well as interns has been that they come in, they bring this fresh, really cool perspective. They're going to top schools, um, extremely talented people that want to do things. And, you know, they're not taking an internship or a job just to push paper per se. They want to have an impact. And the more that you expose them to your business, the more value they bring. I can tell you that, you know, at Rocket Fiber, we started the company in 2014 and started bringing on, you know, interns and then eventually VFA fellows, you know, a couple of years into our business. And they had, an extremely important uh, role and then huge impact in our ability to really grow and scale the company. And they worked in the most impactful projects that we did throughout our six years, you know, prior to the exit. I mean, everything from finance to dealing with clients directly to putting process in place, operations, you name it. On the code side, you know, we have interns that we've hired, um, you know, really from our first year in, in 2017 and, and ongoing. And every time they come in, they bring this like fresh breath of air and we throw all these projects at them and they go and they do research and, you know, they find things that even the industry experts don't think about because it's like, you know, as an industry expert, a lot of times what we find is hey, you've done things for so long and sometimes you're just comfortable in those, in those things. And then you bring this you know, young blood in and, you know, they push your limits. And then from a um, BFA perspective, just echoing what, what Patty said, like, We've hired some of the most talented human beings we've ever worked with through that program. And it's for all the reasons that Patty mentioned, like we have Michael, for example, at, at Code Labs, who's, I'm, I'm gonna give him a shout out because he's, he's an absolute rock star, as are the, the rest that worked at, you know, at Rocket Fiber. But, you know, Michael is, you know, tied to the hip of, you know, myself and, and Etra, the two co-founders, and he's really helping run the company. Um, and, and this was his first job out of college, like real job. So. You know, I, I, I value the, the young talent a lot. And I think that if, you, if you're building a, an innovative, you know, company in 2020 and you don't have this, you know, young blood in the company, I think you're, you're already behind. Yeah, I think that valuing people is kind of the theme here of this whole conversation. And that's what makes great workplaces and great employees. Kendra, Duo is known to be just an excellent place to work. Can you talk about that and how you actually implement that in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we talk about a lot, and you'll hear Doug, who I mentioned early, say a lot, is we don't hire for cultural fit. We hire for cultural contributions. And we really, really focus on living our values out loud every day. And so while our employees themselves are really responsible for um, culture, we have to like cultivate it and tend to the soil of it so that it like develops richly and, and um, consistently over time. And so I would say a couple of those values, I'll just name all four of them and come back and, and talk about a few. One of those is engineering the business. The second is learning together. The third is being kinder than necessary. The fourth is building for the future. So I will talk about being kinder than necessary because we talked about having empathy for our customers, but we also talk about having empathy for one another. Um, and we think that like empathy and kindness are really what make us special at the end of the day. Um, that's really sort of a differentiator. Um, another thing we talk about is engineering the business and anybody at any level can do that. And this is really about building teams that represent like a wide spectrum of identities and perspectives and experiences and being able to look at problems in a wonderful way together that we couldn't by ourselves. Another one that we're particularly fond of together is learning together, right? And so that's getting out of this fixed mindset. And it also means if you learn something new, again, no matter who you are in the company, don't just keep that goodness to yourself, share it with people. Um, maybe put on your own webinar if you want to, right? Like get on a WebEx and, and share it with people. And that also sort of means like holding space for dissenting opinions and amplifying those voices that are sort of like pushing our learning and knowing to the edges. And I really think it's those values that sort of set us apart um, and make us special. Um, so it's our people and our values. 
Thanks a lot. That's awesome. And I thank you for the shout out there, Patty. Hire for cultural contributions is the, the, the quote of the panel. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about onboarding more specifically. And there's another question around, you know, doing these online interviews and figuring out how to do onboarding virtually. All right, I'll pass it back to you to close out the conversation. Yeah, great. Thank you. So this is obviously this is interesting and, and maybe a new area for some, but Andrew, let's talk about Duo being sort of online a uh, company that hundreds of people working for you, and um, you've got a uh, an involved interview process, I yeah. imagine. So, how how has this sort of all worked out for you? Um, now everybody is sort of a hundred percent virtual. I mean, is is this really? Uh, have you been? Were you ready for this? Or or talk about sort of maybe parts of this. Of the interview process maybe that's been adjusted for you folks yeah so we from like a technological standpoint we're ready from a psychological standpoint for like the hiring managers i don't know that we were ready necessarily because there's something really special about having people in the office and then like going to lunch with them and if time allows like taking them to dinner and there's something really great about just sitting across from somebody and how you get to know them there in person that being said, we are a technology company. We work for Cisco, they make WebEx. Um, so we <laughs> haven't really allowed ourselves to make too many excuses to slow ourselves down with hiring. And I think I saw a question in the chat and absolutely we've been extending offers during the pandemic. We just know it's like a little different of an experience and we're trying to make the best of it. I actually think to sort of like recreate that one-on-one -on -one experience that having a coffee chat with your candidate can be really great just to get to know them as a human um, until you can see them in person. Yeah, and that leads into sort of a question that was asked by Kevin a little bit earlier. So I, I think I know what your answer is, Kendra. You kind of set up a patty. Eddie, what, are you comfortable as far as hiring folks via uh, this right here? Patty, what do you think? So I am comfortable. I think it takes more intentionality. You have to spend, um, you need to get the full team involved and get comfortable. And you need to sort through what types of interviews different folks are doing and what are they looking for and, and, and coming together and having discussions. I know at the Broader Invest Detroit, we wound up having, um, I think 10 people, it's a little overkill, but to uh, look at two, two candidates that there was a lot of debate on. And it really was important. We all saw different things, all had different experiences um, because um, of just the time when we had the calls and the, what, what we were looking for. So I think it, it requires planning and uh, thoughtfulness in terms of you know, who's interviewing for what at, and what questions are being asked, but it certainly can be done. We just um, brought on a new principal to our organization on Monday. We had a slight existing prior relationship prior, but uh, the seamlessness of having them integrate on the team in just a few days by being thoughtful about, you know, getting him up to speed before his first day on the platforms and making sure he had the technology that he needed, that he would be able to start, like kind of hit the ground running um, as much as possible. So no hesitancy on the, the hiring front. Uh, I would say they're uh, on the investment front, it's similar. It does take getting used to. I, most people who know me, I'm kind of a, a hugger and a handshaker and I like to, you know, sit across the table and really be able to watch that body language and, and be able to, you know, develop a relationship. But I do think there are ways to do that um, over uh, sort of video calls where you can still see someone's body language, still have a conversation. And so I, I do see work change and our flow changing, right? Where before we used to do all first meetings in person, I'm gonna guess after this crisis, we'll move to a, yeah, let's do the first one or two chats virtually. And then when it makes sense, we'll, we'll get uh, together in person. So I think there are just some interesting learnings about what you can do virtual uh, though. I'll uh, never dislike giving that that uh, hug to my entrepreneurs or the folks that I'm working with, but uh, we'll get back there. You know, it's going to be funny. We'll probably see a whole slew 
of rules on how to interview via <laughs> online, uh, all the way yeah. to what should your virtual background look like to how are you dressed. It's going to be it's going to be quite interesting um, moving forward. Eddie, how how do you make sure you're hiring the right person for the job with this? Because of the, like Patty said, you know, there's that we're losing that ability to shake someone's hand or well, you're probably not giving anybody a hug during an interview. But how do you make sure in this environment you're getting the right person? Yeah, give, give a hug during an interview may, may send the wrong signal there. They think they have the job in the back. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, um, yeah, I mean, look, is it, is it, is it preferred to do things the way we're doing them? No, I'm sure yeah, everybody feels the same way there. Um, can we improvise and make it work? Yes. You know, we've hired actually a few people over the last 30 days uh, virtually. Um, yeah, onboarded them the whole nine yards. Um, and again, is it, is it easy? No. I think you know, when it comes to hiring the right talent, especially during this time, now I go back to the earlier conversation with VFA, like go to the organizations and the places that you know spend a lot of time vetting candidates for you already. Um, that way it makes your, your onboarding process and your you know, hiring decision a lot easier because they've, they've done a lot of the due diligence for you. And if you don't do that, then I think due diligence has become more important than ever. You know, the calls that you know, a lot of companies talk about, we're going to call and check your references and all these other things. And then, you know, not, you know, we don't do them all the time. Sometimes we just, at least from our perspective, we feel that you know, we, we, we got to know the person good enough and, you know, we check on some things. And I think due diligence has become a lot more important than ever. You know, make the calls, talk to people, get the different perspectives, talk to a friend, talk to a former employer, talk to a former coworker, um, and just get a get kind of a holistic view of that person. Um, but then I guess last but not least, you know, in, in our view, um, for us, it's like being very clear with regard to expectations, because I think a lot of times, you know, we want to pitch this like, you know, at least I've seen some organizations where they get stuck pitching like the coolness of working. They forget that there's actually work that needs to get done and business that needs to you know, keep on going and there are things that need to happen. So being very intentional with the fact that, hey, yes, we do love our people. Yes, we'll do anything for our people, but we also expect a whole lot from our people. Um, because that's why we've been able to do what we've been able to do. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, you know, the idea of, of hiring people and, and going back to that quote, I do agree that it's, it's an amazing quote, hire for culture and contribution. Uh, like you want people that come in and, and, you know, bring different perspectives and, you know, add the value to add, but you also need to understand and, and be intentional and upfront about the core values that, you know, you as a business stand for that are just non-negotiable. And not talking to those during the interview process makes it harder. And, and I think if you're upfront and honest about all of that, I think the hiring process becomes a bit easier, regardless of whether it's virtual or otherwise, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Excellent point. Sarah, we're running out of time. Yeah, I, there's one more thing I want to add is that I'll be happy to share. VFA is putting together a um, like a virtual hiring and onboarding um, like kind of guide and recommendation for our company partners. I'd be happy to share a version of that with all, all the folks who signed up for this webinar today. But everything that the panelists have mentioned, um, plus a couple of other perspectives, so I'll make sure to share that with this group. Um, but I think that's it for now. Um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. Um, all right, do you want to close us off? I have to uh, thank you, panel, Kendra, Eddie, Patty. Thanks for being on today. I, I think that every time we do one of these, we're certainly either learning something new about what we need to be doing, or it's really reinforcing the, the work that we're all doing. So uh, thank you to all of you for, for being on, on here today. And uh, I'm going to give actually the last word to Sarah, because she really put a lot of this together the topic and, and all of you folks. I will say we are, uh, to all the folks that are on this, we are recording this. We will put this out uh, on our website. Uh, if you want more information about uh, MVCA, you can go to michiganvca.org for some more information. 
And with that, Sarah, you, you get the final word. So I'm going to let you uh, High pressure here. Um, no, I'll just share that if you are looking for talent or thinking about bringing folks on um, any time through the end of the year, then please let us know. Um, I'm sure any of our panelists would also be more than willing to share additional info with folks who are maybe having issues in this process. But we are here as a community to support each other. And the success of you all is uh, crucial to our region's survival. So thanks so much for doing this. And we're here to help. Have a great afternoon, everybody.